The music you just heard uh, is music I generated with Python code, and I'm pretty sure that by the end of this talk, uh, you'll pretty much know how to do it yourself. Uh, today we're going to talk about music synthesis with Python. Music synthesis has been around since the mid-80s. But uh, what makes it so special to talk about today is that there are quite a lot of Python packages and models that really mature to the point that they're really robust and we can really use them in real-time applications. We have quite a few of them that are that, that worth talking about and we'll cover most of them. Um, my name is Dror Ayalon. Just a quick brief about myself. I studied uh, communications and human computer interactions for my undergrad. Post my graduation, I became a product manager and worked in the, uh, in the Israeli startup scene for about five to six years. Um, during this time, I realized that I'm not only you know, in love with managing the development process, but I want to build stuff on my, for, for my own purposes. And I got familiar with Python, and it quickly became my biggest hobby. And uh, Last year, I uh, enrolled in NYU in a program called ITP, where I focused mostly on machine learning, using information retrieval, and about the intersection between these two fields uh, that allowed me to uh, build audio applications for musicians for creative purposes. So this is what we're going to cover today. Um, the first topic is music synthesis and a variety of, uh, of Python packages that allow us to create music using just simple lines of code. Then we're going to talk about a more common and more uh, a more known uh, Python task uh, that is related to audio and, and music, and that's uh, audio analysis. And we'll wrap up by seeing how we can combine these two fields to build creative applications. So let's get right to it. We'll start with uh, music synthesis. And the first package I want to talk to you about is Pio. Pio is a package that was developed by uh, the Ajax Sound Studio in Montreal. Uh, Absolutely one of the best packages I ever used. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a C, it's a Python model version uh, in C. It, it has really amazing out-of-the-box uh, objects that you can use to generate music and to build your own compositions, to use it as a, as a sound engine for games. Uh, it also does a lot of uh, tasks that relate to music analysis. And uh, it has great documentations. And you know, just to give you a, a, a a demo of, uh, of how easy it is to use Pio to generate music, I want us to do this. All right, so uh, once Pio is installed, okay, we import it and we start a server. To start a server means that we have a thread running in the background waiting for us to send information to it and it will you know, make sure that whatever we send it will go outside of the speakers, okay? So we have the server running and what I'm doing here is that I'm, uh, I'm setting up uh, I'm basically shaping our signal, okay? I'm using a square table, which means that it's a Python list or a Python matrix that describes how the signal will behave, okay? Uh, then I'm setting up the beat using the out-of-the-box uh, Metro object. And we'll start by, by uh, I mean, uh, think about a beat as, for, for a computer, a beat is, uh, is taking a signal and just saying, uh, when do we want to play it, okay? So, uh, so we play it every second and we'll use the simple polyphony as possible. Um, and we'll set up an envelope just to make it a bit more interesting. I'm using a cosine table as our amplitude envelope. I'm applying everything uh, to be our amplitude envelope. I'm using the beat and the envelope. The duration of the envelope will be quarter of a second and this is the amplitude. And I'm just triggering random MIDI notes, okay? So uh, it would sound like that. Okay, just a simple beat. We can make it more interesting if we'll make some polyphony to it. Or if we'll make it an odd number. And we'll shorten the beat. Okay, we can, for example, change the, let's change the MIDI notes to something that is more interesting. Okay, or maybe if you, if you came from the Game Boy generation, you probably appreciate that. You can change the scale. Kind of nice. All right, let's just stick with a simple low end beat. And you probably love synths the way I love them. So uh, here I'm, you know, again setting up, um, setting up a, uh, a signal, just shaping it uh, to make it, you know, to help the, 
uh, significant timber so we can identify it. Setting up it, um, again the tempo here uh, using the metro object that is a built-in object. Uh, they have an LFO object which is really nice and we're gonna we're gonna use it just to hear the oscillation okay of a signal. Uh, I'm applying again the envelope and I'm using an FM synth just a fabulous object they have out of the box and sounds like that. Okay we can increase the amplitude so we'll hear it more dramatically. Okay, and we can change the frequency of it. Just return to the previous one to make it softer. And this is the LFO that you hear. Okay, it's just a function that goes up and down. And one of the really sweet things they have is a sawtooth object that is actually simulating the 80s synth that we used to that we used to love. So I'm using a sine wave and the saw, the super saw object as they call it, and it sounds like that. That's nice, right? That's a throwback. Okay. Again, you can change the frequency and all, but let's continue. You stop every every synth just like that. You can stop the server entirely. Yeah. All right, so that was Pio. Thank you, guys. Now, Pio comes with a built-in uh, GUI component that allows you to build, build, uh, to build desktop applications over Pio. So uh, these are two examples from the Ajax uh, studio themselves. Um, Soundgrain is, uh, is a desktop application that allows you to synthesize sound using granular synthesis. Granular synthesis, if you don't know it, it's, uh, it's basically taking uh, a recording and you know, using tiny chunks of audio, of like, uh, I don't know, 20 milliseconds of audio. And when you combine them all together to clouds of audio, to paths of audio, you get really nice sounds that you probably won't be able to get otherwise. Um, the other one is uh, Cecilia. Cecilia is, you know what, Cecilia actually gives you everything that Pio can give you on a desktop application. They just want to build something that will allow you to experiment with Pio. So if you think about using Pio and you don't want to go deep into the code or the documentation, Cecilia is a really you know, nice way to go to get familiar with it. So just to, sum uh, just to uh, summarize things, oh, sorry. OK, so just to summarize things, um, uh, basically, uh, Pio gives you an out-of-the-box DSP uh, functions, out-of-the-box uh, tons of objects that you can really use to synthesize music. It has fabulous documentation. Uh, it's open source, and they have uh, uh, they have a mailing list you can just sign up to, and they respond they respond really quickly to any question. Uh, I, I'll post a link on the repository of the talk, so you will be able to investigate it yourself. And another genre of uh, of um, uh, music synthesis uh, software you can use is audio engines. Uh, audio engines are essentially uh, a pack of software written originally in C that they have Python API we can use, so we don't need to learn the syntax of these audio engines. We can use our Python skills to use them. Okay, the first one is C sound. That's my personal favorite. It was developed originally in 85 at MIT, written in C. Um, it doesn't come with a built-in API. It used to come with a built-in API, but it was deprecated for some unknown reason. And currently, the community uh, built their own API, which is almost similar to the original one, and it works really well. Uh, also supports the, uh, the OSC protocol. The OSC is a protocol, the open sound control protocol is a protocol that allows communication between music softwares and between the controllers of music, stuff like that. Uh, so if you don't want to learn their own uh, uh, API, you can use the OSC for that. Another, uh, uh, maybe that's the most popular engine out there. Uh, Super Collider was developed in '96. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, it has um, it has the SC package. That is, it supports only Python 2.2.7. By looking at it, I have to say that upgrading it to to support Python 3 is not a lot of work. But currently, it doesn't support Python 3. Um, but it's a very stable and and uh, well documented uh, package. Uh, you can also use Foxdot instead of, you know, it's, again, it's not learning the, the super collider syntax. You can use Foxdot and other fabulous uh, uh, Python package to control super collider as your sound engine. Uh, also supports the OSC. And the most recent one is Chuck, was developed in um, 2003 at Princeton, uh, written in C or like a flavor of C, I would say. Uh, the, the problem with Chuck that it doesn't have a stable or at least a fully functional Python API currently, at least not that I know of. Uh, I, the, the one that I used to use is 
becoming more and more buggy, and I'm pretty sure it will be fixed, but at least now I cannot recommend you know, taking Chuck out of the shelf if you haven't used any of these uh, audio engines before. Um, okay, so I want to show you a demo of Super Collider as the sound engine, and how do I code in Python using Foxdot as its API. All right. Yeah, so I'm launching Foxdot. Foxdot comes with uh, with a built-in uh, interactive environment and its own interpreter. Um, the, the first thing, uh, we're gonna use just the built-in stuff, all right, just to, uh, just to make sure that, uh, that everything is clear. I'm setting up a new player, okay, as a synth, and the first thing I love to do is to create a baseline, okay, so I'm using the, the built-in base, let's just make some arbitrary numbers here. Let's make the duration four seconds, the amplitude one, it will sound like that. All right, that's pretty boring. Um, one cool thing that I love to do is to use tuples to create chords, so they would sound like that. That's a bit more interesting. And we can combine that with lists and do something like that. So now we'll get something that is a bit more interesting. Let's hear it. Okay. All right. Let's create another synth. And this one is my personal favorite. This is the, uh, the MB synth. Sorry. See how easy it is just to create, you know, to use the out of the shelf uh, objects just to get familiar with what, what's possible. Okay, so creating the ambient the, the synth. Let's give it again just a random number to begin with and we'll modify along the way. Um, let's make the duration one and the amplitude one. Also change the duration of different notes so we can say that the first one would be a full second but the next one will be half a second and half a second we can also change the amplitude for each one separately so we can say okay so that would be like a quarter of the full amplitude all right okay so we get something a bit more interesting and let's create another synth documented in Foxdot, so you don't really need to remember anything. Alright, that's a bit aggressive. But again, let's just add a few notes and I'm pretty sure it will be sweeter. Okay, that's nice. Right? Okay, let's make the last one and move on. Um, this one would be a pads synth. It usually sounds really nice. I hope it's in a good mood today. Um, and I'll just make it. Let's make two notes. These are MIDI notes, by the way. So, uh, as you can see, I'm trying to keep everything on the low end of the frequencies. tuples and lists to have notes and then a chord. Okay, I think that's enough. We can stop everything. Stopping things is pretty easy. Stop that first. Stop. Same four stop. And we'll stop the crawl. Cool. 
Yeah, so there was Foxdot as an API for uh, Super Collider as its audio engine. Okay, it was, to me it was relatively easy. Um, all right, uh, you know, I, I want to talk about a really more common task and that's audio analysis. And I know that usually when people think about audio analysis, uh, the, you know, the common packages that comes to mind are, you know, probably NumPy and SciPy, and uh, there is a Pi audio analysis, which is really robust and has a lot of built-in uh, algorithms that can give you a lot of information about audio. There's also Essentia, uh, an open source uh, package that is really well documented and, um, and can give you a lot of things out of the box. But what I really love to use is Librosa, a package that uh, was originally developed, not originally, still developed uh, in NYU by Brian McPhee. And I want to show you a quick demo of Librosa just to see how easy it is to get useful information out of audio uh, with a few lines of code. So, uh, once we import Librosa, um, okay, I, I recorded uh, something just for the sake of the demo. Okay, let's just hear it quickly. Here are the repetitions. Okay, it repeats itself. So the electric guitar, okay. And then there's a sudden change. We got it. Okay, so we load the audio and uh, you know, the usually this is the way people look at audio as a time series of, of, uh, of amplitudes. And, uh, and just with a single line of code, we can compute a chromogram. Okay, uh, using Librosa, and this chromogram shows us that I was playing uh, F sharp, and then G sharp, and then I was playing B, and the repetitions of it, and you can see that the different colors here, the harmonics of, of the sound. So uh, if you want to classify instruments, that's a good way to classify instruments, because you can identify the timbre of, uh, of the instrument. It classifies uh, frequencies into uh, speech classes. Um, but what I really like to do with Librosa is to use its similarity matrices. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm getting the strength of the onset events on the recording. Onset event is when something uh, dramatically happened during the recording. Usually when it's dramatic and repeated, it's a beat okay, of the recording. Uh, so I'm not only getting the times of these beats, I'm getting the, the strength of each event. Um, so I'm getting this, uh, this strength, I'm getting the beats using its built-in uh, beat tracking algorithm, and uh, I'm getting the tempo, so I know that the tempo of the recording that you just heard is uh, 151 BPM, and I'm getting the, the beats as a Python list, so I can sync them, I can actually create, uh, um, I can execute a new, uh, the, the function of the chromogram again and to get the chromogram information and then to sync the bits with the chromogram, which means they'll get only the information that I need at the time of the beat, okay? So this is just a common way to reduce information on audio recording. Um, and what I do next is that I try to find similarities within the, uh, the sync uh, data that I got. And what I see here, this, this beautiful thing, shows me that there is repetitions in the song, okay? So each one of these paths uh, shows me a repetition within the song. So I can say that, uh, you know, for example, on frame 30 happens something that is very identical to what happens on frame five, okay? And you can see here that it repeats, there is a repetition for three, like three repetitions and then something different happens and then the repetitions are very similar to what we heard at the beginning, okay? So this is the type of information I really, really like. You, as you can see, you can get a lot of it. You can, uh, sorry, you can get a lot out of it. Um, all right, so that was Librosa. And last, I want to show you a project that I worked on last year. It is called Luntz, and it combines audio analysis and music synthesis. What Luntz does is it, it captures recording, live recording from a player analyzes the recording and generate sound using C sound, the audio engine that we talked about, that gives the musician the musical context of the original recording. So it's not jamming with the musician, it gives him the context to keep on developing his musical idea, okay? It's like having a bass player in your room, hearing what you're playing and giving you like, you know, some hint on what you originally played so you can jam with it, okay? Let's see it on a video. I think it will be a bit clearer. Okay, so the sound you hear is the default sound of this installation or product. Ah, 
Yeah, yeah, the guy with the beard is me last year. Okay. Yeah, things change. Okay, so what we see here on the right, there's a script that runs in the background, captures the music recording, analyzes it using Librosa, captures the recording using uh, Pi Audio, analyzes it using Librosa. This is me playing. The analysis happens, and then after I realize what is the scale, what, uh, what notes I played, uh, what, what will go harmonically uh, correct with this, with this recording, I'm sending data to C-Sound, and the other script, the script on the right is playing something that is correct to the original idea. This process can happen time and time again. Um, the analysis will correct itself to send some new data. Um, again, you can hear that you know the recording, the the sound in the background is not a it's not a jamming type of thing. It's not music that you would listen to. It's just music as a tool to develop musical ideas. Here we can see another cycle of it. As you can see in a second, the analysis will happen and information will be sent to C-Sound. Hear the adjustment in the background. Yeah, so that was Luntz. Okay, so that is it. Um, you can get all the information that I just mentioned uh, on the GitHub repository and uh, uh, if you have any questions or if you need more information, if you do projects in this field and you want to share them, I would love that. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, if you have any questions, uh, feel free. Yeah. How come they picked Hans Zimmer to do the Blade Runner soundtrack and not you? How what? How come they picked Hans Zimmer to do the Blade Runner soundtrack and not you? <laughs> Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's the learning algorithm you use for the bass players? So, okay, so there is no, uh, you know, machine learning going on there. I know, yeah, it's trivial to think that, you know, everything that does something really tricky is going through a machine learning process, but it's not. It's just uh, um, real time processing of the audio recording, and if I, like, if I, if I needed machine learning, it's only because the data is so large and I need to find a good way to iterate on that. But the technique here was to reduce the data, to make, to take, for example, you know, the audio samples you can get from a 10 second recording is millions. So if you find a good way to really decrease the data, you, you can do things really fast. So, so the analysis is that, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm analyzing the recording, getting the notes, understanding if the notes relate to a specific scale. And then uh, after I'm, I, I realized what is the scale and what, is the, uh, what, what could be harmonically correct with this scale, I'm generating something that is not trivial, which means that I'm not you know, going over the entire scale. I'm just throwing note every here and then and trying to make it close to the original recording so it won't be an expansion of the idea, what it would be giving, you know, a frame to the original idea, not trying to expand it, you know, using computational algorithms. So, um, some, what are some uh, libraries that provide uh, this progression So, uh, Librosa does that. It's not, I mean, it won't give you the progression itself, but it would give you enough data so you can understand what is the progression. Um, and I, I believe that there are many packages that would do the same. They won't give you straight answers, like what is the core progression or what is the scale, but, uh, but it will give you enough data so you can understand that. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. yeah thanks so much for sharing all that. Sure. Yeah.
Yeah, so I, first of all, there are a lot of papers that, that deal with this type of data, and I think that every year they have something new to say. Uh, but what I use it, you know, specifically is, you know, sometimes I believe that there is similarity within the song. Sometimes I want to identify a repetition, but this is a good tool to do that. Uh, and another thing is that sometimes when I see that the data is not clear at the end of the process, I see that the matrix, the, the you know, the graphically is not something that I can iterate on and, and you know, get useful information. And it's like a debugging tool for me. So I know that there was something bad uh, earlier in the process and I need to refine my algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I'm getting it. Oh yeah, I mean, there are a lot of, you know, if, if I'm understanding the question correctly, there are a lot of packages that allow, you know, live coding of stuff and also mapping to MIDI controllers. So you can, you know, sometimes I, I could see people, you know, mapping a controller that is actually playing stuff and then it just write the beginning of, of a code, a beginning of a function, so you can continue with that. Is this answering your question? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I can't I can't take any more questions, but I'm here, so feel free to talk to me. All right. Thanks guys. Okay.